Well, if you were here last week, we talked about Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, where Jesus reads from the scroll of Isaiah in his hometown, where he says these words, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he reads this scroll of Isaiah in his hometown and says, Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing, that the, his presence is the fulfillment of this promise. Now, maybe if you were intrigued by that, because we didn't go much past that, we only went right there. So maybe um, you read ahead. Did anybody read ahead? It's okay. It's not cheating to read ahead. If you did, you'll notice uh, they didn't like that. They got a little bit upset. They knew exactly who this Jesus was. And they became so angry with him that they pulled him out of the synagogue, wanted to take him to a high cliff and throw him off. That was their response to God's keeping his promise to this invitation. But did you see what it was that Jesus said that really got him mad? He says to them that a prophet isn't accepted in his hometown. And then he says these words in Luke 4:25. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet none of them was cleansed. Only Naaman, the Syrian. It's at this moment that the people get really upset. Well, why should they? All Jesus is doing is telling them the story they already know. But it's the intended meaning of this passage that he quotes where he references Elijah and Elisha and these prophets of God and the people of Israel, the promised chosen people of God, who reject the word of the Lord. And so God blesses foreigners instead. This is too hard for them to hear. Jesus' implication is quite clear. If a prophet isn't accepted in their hometown, if Jesus' words aren't going to be heard in Nazareth, then he'll simply take the blessings of God and pour them out somewhere else. Because the blessing of God is going to happen. God's presence is going to be felt. And so at the end of Luke chapter 4 begins a slew of miracles performed by Jesus. Luke begins to tell the story of Jesus with this proclamation, the coming of the Messiah, to bless people. And then he starts listing off what Jesus does as he leaves his hometown. Because although he didn't perform miracles there, he does perform them. And so we see him in Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Jesus speaks to a fever. The Greek word is funny. He rebuked it means he warned it. Did Jesus say, fever, you know who I am, that's it. And the fever, oh. Didn't mean to cause offense. So the fever left. But it's more than just the miraculous healing of the fever. Did you notice what happened? She got up and started fixing a meal. 
because you see she's not weak anymore. Right. Completely. Completely healed. Not just are you feeling better? Yeah, I, I, think, I think the fever's gone. No, she immediately hops up out of bed and it's like, good morning. And get about cooking and doing my day. No loss of strength in this illness. Jesus can cast out the fever and he can cause strength to return. And then things get really interesting. If you look at chapter 5, or at the end of chapter 4, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to him, came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I have been sent. That's exactly what he does. Jesus begins preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Here he performs another miracle, giving the sons of Zebedee, and this Simon and Andrew, their biggest catch of fish. Do you remember this miracle? This moment where he tells them to go fishing and they can't pull in the fish? Simon wants Jesus to leave. That's what he says. At this moment of this miraculous catch of fish, Simon throws himself down in the presence of Jesus and says, Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. And he begs Jesus to leave. I wonder if uh, Luke wants you to notice that this is what demons do in the presence of Jesus too. That Simon has this moment where he recognizes who this is. This isn't just a man. This is something beyond his understanding. But what he does understand is that he is not worthy to be in the presence of this man, Jesus. And he asks him to leave. He calls these four disciples, invites them to go with him. And this wandering preacher, this one thrown out of his own hometown, whose life was threatened, begins a movement now, normally, this is the third week in a row that I've mentioned this, we like to talk about the beginning being Acts chapter 2. But for Luke, it's just one story. And this is the beginning, where Jesus proclaims the fulfillment of God's promise that it has arrived, and we see the beginning to take shape as God through Jesus, begins to call all men to himself. And he chooses these four fishermen and asks them to be fishers of men and to go with him. This is the beginning. The Messiah is bringing ordinary people into the kingdom of God and preparing them to do exactly the same thing that he does. He will teach these disciples to do what he does. And then there's the story of two men. It's found in Luke, 15, or Luke 5, verses 12 through 15. When Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to him to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. This prophet is not just casting out demons or rebuking fevers. He cures lepers, too. And the news of Jesus spreads, and people from all around start coming to him, wanting to be healed of all kinds of diseases. And now he has attracted the attention of the Pharisees. And they come from all around. 
They will show up in every village to investigate every rumor that they hear about Jesus. They join the crowds listening and watching, wondering what to make of this man. One day as he was teaching Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins? He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. Okay, I just covered a whole bunch of ground. Did you notice? We just covered a whole lot of scripture really quickly. But I had to. Because this is how Luke introduces Jesus. In his public ministry, all of this happens. Boom. And Jesus, it's obvious, is more than just another prophet. He's more than just some traveling preacher. This is something different. He's not just a great speaker. He's not just another moral teacher. He is something else entirely. This Jesus is full of God's power. Luke is sure to point that out to us. That the power of God was present to heal. That's the way he introduces Jesus. Jesus shows up and is rejected by those who know him the best. Isn't that strange? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Don't we know his parents? And their response to the message of God is, we have to kill this guy right now. And so he leaves. He goes on his way, and he will perform miracles of healing that will capture the imagination of an entire country, will cause them to send investigators. Pharisees will come out and they're going to test this Jesus. Because is he more? Is he more than just another nameless prophet? Twice he has told us in this section, in Luke 4 and 5, that he has come to preach good news to the poor. And he doesn't just mean with words. It's Luke's record of the actions of Jesus that really capture the attention of the people in their time. Not just the words of good news, but Jesus' blessing that he pours out on people as he encounters them, whether it's a leper seeking healing or a paralyzed man who wants to walk, Jesus brings the blessing to the poor. So those words, blessed are the poor in spirit, take on a whole new shape with one who can heal, who can cast out demons and rebuke fevers, cause the lame to walk. We really see the pronouncement of Isaiah taking shape right here. His words are important. 
But how much teaching has Jesus done in Luke 4 and 5? If he's done very much, Luke didn't write it down. Luke seems interested in the actions of Jesus. The pronouncement, I'm willing, be clean. I tell you, get up and walk, go home. This seems to be the preaching in Luke 4 and 5. The words that the paralyzed man wanted to hear, the church is fascinated by these ones. Your sins are forgiven. And I can preach an entire sermon about Jesus can forgive sins and the uproar that it causes. Have you heard this sermon? Jesus, a man forgiving sin? Who can do that? But if you look in the story of Luke 4 and 5, what are the words the man on the mat wanted to hear? If you know the answer, shout them out. Get up and walk. The forgiving of sins is significant. It is. But the evidence that Jesus can forgive sins is the man stood up and walked. Right? That's the words that the man and his friends longed to hear. That Jesus could do something about the suffering of this man. Not just some religious rhetoric that would pronounce him a child of God. Come in, into the kingdom. They wanted to see evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. And it was the evidence of the walking that the man did that amazed the people. Not simply the forgiveness of sins. These two chapters of Luke are amazing because they set the stage for the rest of the book. Not just this one, but Acts. This looks more like Acts than it does anything we're used to. This is exactly the same thing we'll see Peter and John do in the book of Acts. They'll give what they have, which is the power of healing. They'll extend to the world and spread the gospel of Jesus, and the crowds will be amazed at the power released through these men who are just fishermen. That's what makes the gospel powerful, is the presentation of the action of God released in the lives of ordinary people. I know that it's tempting for us to look back at the beginning of the book of Luke and see Luke write these words. I've, I've done a thorough investigation as though he's engaging this logical part of our brain, that all of this stuff is true. I've spoken to the eyewitnesses, and so, Theophilus, you can depend upon this message. Luke is not interested in triggering your rational response. Luke isn't interested in you reasoning through the identity of Jesus. If he were, he wouldn't lay the case out like this. What he's asking you to believe isn't logic. He's not asking you to rationally come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah. What Luke is going to do in his gospel is overwhelm you until you experience a sense of awe and wonder at the coming of the Son of God. That's why in his gospel... He records all those names. Luke isn't a Jew. He doesn't care which father begat which son. What he's interested in is that you trace Jesus back to the beginning and see that Adam was the son of God. And so too is Jesus. And he's not asking your head to believe it. He's asking your heart to know it's true. 
Because do you know what the difference is? Your head will convince you that you have to depend upon doctors. If there's ever going to be someone to argue against that, it's going to be Luke. He's a doctor. He doesn't ask you to depend upon medicine. He asks you to believe in the power of God who rebukes a fever. Luke, the human being, Luke, would share with you the reality that he is not an eyewitness. He didn't see these things. But he did talk to the people that saw it. And he has walked away with a conviction of heart that Jesus is doing exactly what he promised to do. That when God's people rejected the message, he turned the blessing out to the entire world. Because you see, Luke is an outsider. He doesn't belong. And yet, the record of these words, there were many widows in Israel. But Elijah wasn't sent to them. He was sent to a foreigner, a widow in Zarephath. And there were lots of people in Israel who were sick. But Elisha was sent to heal a Syrian the invitation of Jesus is for everyone to accept the good news that Jesus is offering. This gets a little complicated because what I need to ask you to do today is to think about something that is fundamentally um, hard for us. We're convinced that we can rationally convince people to believe in Jesus. I don't believe you can. I spend a lot of time with irrational people. We call them teenagers. Do you know how hard it is for me to convince them of something using logic? and reason it's almost impossible what's interesting is it's harder to convince the grown-up version but what I do know is that there are teenagers that I work with every day that occasionally come into my office because they're at the end of their rope there's nowhere left to go. And do you know what they're seeking? Hope. And hope, friends, is not rational. Hope is what you hang on to when every instinct says it's hopeless. When every report says it's impossible. When every outcome that you can imagine is negative. Hope. The leper hoped Jesus would cure him. The paralyzed man, his friends, hoped Jesus would cure him. Peter, Andrew, James and John hoped Jesus would leave them alone. That's why that story is recorded. If they accept the invitation of Jesus, life is now uncertain. And they were more afraid of what could happen if they went with that man. Hope has to be infused in our language because without it we cannot be effective in preaching the good news of Jesus. Do you understand what I mean? 
Hope is the most powerful testimony we have. That I have hope in the power of Jesus. And I hope he can do an awful lot. I hope that he forgives sin. Even the sin I continue to struggle with. I hope he will forgive. I hope that he will empower me to live here. Because there are days when living here is not any fun at all. In fact, there are times when living here are filled with dread. I can't watch the news because our world seems to be unraveling. And I hope Jesus will help me, will help my loved ones, will somehow bring healing to our world because there's so much wrong. And I hope that when I close my eyes for the very last time, I will wake up new. We hope in all of those things. And our language to a world that needs good news has to be infused with hope. Do you have a story of someone who shouldn't have gotten well? Can you think of one? That's a story of hope for someone who's struggling. And you need to tell it. Do you have a story of someone who had burned every bridge, who had rejected every offer of help, who had cut people out of their life, and then restoration came? And there's a story of hope? You have to tell that story. Because there are people in the world who don't believe their relationship will ever get better. And do you have a story where you were wrong? Where you were sinful? Where you chose selfishness instead of service? Where you wanted so much, whatever it was, that you told God no, and you pushed him away, and then he found you again? That's a story of hope, and our world needs to hear it. If you're here this morning and you've never claimed Jesus as Lord, I wish I had time for you to listen to all of the stories in the room. But one thing that they would all say is that believe God. Believe the words of Jesus. Believe in his invitation to transform your life Give up and let Jesus have you. Claim him as Lord. Take him on in baptism. Have your sin washed away. Take hold of hope in the resurrection. New life offered in Jesus. The stories around the room, they would beg you to believe that. And if you're a believer who's dedicated to God, but hope seems so far away, that seems impossible, there are stories in this room that would tell you it is never impossible. It is always available. If, 
If you need something this morning, we want to encourage you to stand with you, to bring a message of good news. And we would invite you to come and make that need known. Just come to the front while we stand together and sing.